So I'm going to be talking about the future of humanity, and I would say this is all falls into what I would describe evidence and expertise in a post-truth world. So if we go through and we look at our place in the universe, let's start from a cosmological perspective. 13.8 billion years ago, something happened. We call it the Big Bang. The universe as we know it was formed, and it has been expanding ever since, getting larger and larger. About 13 billion years ago, the first galaxies formed. One of those was the Milky Way galaxy, which we live. A hundred billion stars, probably five times more than that planets. And on one of those planets, 4.545 billion years ago, Earth emerged from a sea of dust and gas in probably a cluster of stars that looks not dissimilar to the Pleiades or Seven Sisters that we see in the sky throughout the planet Earth today. Earth, we have no reason to believe, is a particularly special place, one of many, but it has been special because it has had the conditions that has allowed life to emerge. And it's quite remarkable that life emerged almost immediately on planet Earth after it cooled. It emerged as uh, little tiny uh, animals, single-celled animals, and you can see evidence in this rock, and this is a discovery at ANU made last year, the oldest life on planet Earth, 3.8 billion years ago. And that is about when we think, that's when we think life more or less emerged. And the fact that it emerged so quickly sort of makes you wonder, well then the world, the universe must be full of life. But there's another problem, is that when we look at all of the life that is on planet Earth today, every single cell that we have ever seen has the same parent. So life emerged almost immediately, but it seems to have only emerged and survived once. So that leaves us with an interesting problem. Is life really common? Or is life really rare and we just got lucky? We don't know. But we are out looking. And my bad noon colleagues, uh, colleagues are in the middle of uh, putting a telescope in West Timor to help search for those exoplanets. And that is work that uh, at ANU we hope to help them with and helping build the instruments as a partnership. And that's just one of the many ways that ANU as the National University of Australia can help work with Indonesia. And we've been talking countless other ways to do it as well on this trip. The other thing is that when life emerged, it didn't get very complicated it stayed very, very simple for almost two and a half billion years. And then about a billion years ago, something happened. The first multi-celled organisms emerged. And once that happened, complica complicated animals that are what we think of life today was almost instantaneously upon us. And it has been going ever since the last billion years. So life, is something that we're only really going to discover about by looking, I think, to other planets because it is so complicated here on Earth. Now, about 200,000 years ago, let's say 120,000 years ago for Homo sapiens, we emerged as a species. And about 80,000 years ago, humans got down to probably only 300 individuals. We came very close to going extinct. It was during the middle of an ice age. And then we made it through that rough patch. And then for the last 20 or 30,000 years, it looks to archaeologists that there's been roughly four or so million uh, humans on planet Earth throughout prehistoric time. This is a time before civilizations emerged. It's a time before we had technology. 
And then technology started emerging. And it emerged probably first in um, essentially the Euphrates region, Iraq and Iran, not completely clear. But once that happened, the number of people on Earth started rising. A rise that has more or less not stopped since roughly 4,000 years ago, or 4,000 4, years uh, BC, 6,000 years ago. And that rise of humanity to the point where we have 7.4 billion people has been made possible by technology. And technology has built entirely on knowledge and evidence. So one of the things I want to talk about is why we need to worry about the notion of knowledge and evidence being threatened. Because we have an experiment, our own selves, of what happens when we don't use knowledge and evidence. The Earth had, for 100,000 years, less than 4 million people on it. The big challenge that humanity has now is we are 7.4 billion people. And yet we live on a planet that is still 6,700 kilometers in radius, a little less than 13,000 kilometers across. And that has always been so big throughout humanity's existence that it was infinite. But with 7.4 billion people, it no longer is infinite. We are changing the earth that we live on for the first time. And we will continue to change the earth that we're living on it and potentially grow to being more than 7.4 billion people unless we think about what we're doing. These are the population estimates of the United Nations going forward up to 2050. Now, I plan on still being alive in 2050. Um, I'm 50 right now, so we'll see. I'll be old. But you can see this is a logarithmic diagram. So it actually, things don't look quite so bad if you're not used to logarithmic diagrams. But we can see that Australia probably will continue to grow, but we don't matter because we're so small. We have Asia, but also Africa, continuing to grow. And the question is, is Asia going to grow a little bit or a lot? And is Africa going to grow a lot or a real lot? Now, depending on what we do, we might end up at eight and a half billion people, not too much more than we have now. Or we might end up at 12 or 13 billion people, almost twice what we are in the next 30 years. And I would argue that Earth can ill afford twice as many people on it as we have now, unless we have a major revolution in technology, which I would say we should not count on until it happens. So population and the ability and the, and the stuff that people use uh, go hand in hand. So here is the world's energy consumption. And it very much follows the human population, except for it goes up faster. And that's because Indonesians are using more power and more energy, but not nearly as much as Australians are using more power and more energy. The developed world is using enormous amounts of electricity and, uh, and energy. I think it's roughly five times per person difference between Australia and Indonesia right now. And what I predict is that as Indonesia becomes more and more affluent, unless technology intervenes, you're going to have the same energy consumption as Australia. And so that means we're going to, at an even faster rate, consume our uh, natural resources. And that is something that is going to happen even if we control our population, unless, again, technology intervenes. And of course, we're beginning to see the first uh, uh, signs, evidence, of how we're affecting the Earth. The bottom diagram is the last uh, 
2,000 years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and you can see it's risen very rapidly. The temperature has gone up a bit. It hasn't gone up very much yet. And the question is, how much will it go up? Well, the modeling for this is still hard. And there's been a great deal of concern to say, well, we're not very good at modeling, therefore we should not believe any of it. There are those who believe it exactly. That's also not correct. But these are our best estimates. And if we completely put the brakes on how much greenhouse gases we consume and decarbonize by about 2060, we could just imagine getting to between one and two and a half degrees Celsius. That is probably a pretty unrealistic trajectory right now, given how well we've done in the last five years, which hasn't been good. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we go sort of business as usual, don't try hard, and just let technology sort of take us where it naturally does, then you can see we're going to be going three, four, five degrees by 2100. I do not intend on being alive in 2100, but my grandkids will be. My children will probably just be on the edge. So that is a profound change, and that's just business as usual. Sometimes people forget, they say, well, two degrees isn't bad. And I'm like, well, two degrees is problematic, but that's not what we're talking about. If we all try really, really hard, we get to two degrees. We, we just keep going up otherwise. And we're going to have to learn to adapt. A lot is already in motion. We sit here on the second floor of a building that is just barely above sea level. This is the prediction of sea level rise to 2100, and it's going up by a half to a full meter no matter what we do. And that's going to continue and there's no way for us to stop it for the next century after that. So, you know, if you're here in Jakarta, we need to start thinking about an even more elaborate set of dikes and canals than you have right now, because I know February, having been here once in February, is an interesting time of year to be in Jakarta, uh, and February is gonna be all year round unless we start working on this. So we do need to start thinking about the technology because it's going to take 30 to 50 years to bring it in. And what happens if we don't? Well, this is a picture from Australia, the 1930s, uh, and it shows what happens when animals exceed their ability, their resources of, of the land that's around them. Uh, and we can do it like every other species does on Earth. That is just let it go. Don't worry. It'll be right and we're gonna end up looking like the rabbits in Australia in the 1930s. We will be the subject of starvation, of disease, of war, and massive loss of life if we do not address this issue. It is a trajectory that will not uh, go away. We cannot just keep with business as usual. It is only by being human. Humans are the only animal that modify their course in history, that can go through and not be subject to overpopulation through the use of technology. And that, the consequences of not controlling uh, of this will be something that affects us in our lifetime, but especially our children and grandchildren. Now, we are beginning already to see how this manifests itself. If you were in Europe, you would have thought that 2015-16 was the year of the refugee. Because for European standards, it was a very bad year. I think people who live in Africa wouldn't have thought it was any worse than any number of years. Um, hopefully, I lost anything. But people move. People are connected. Every single one of us, including most of the towns in Africa, have one, something like this. Everyone knows what's going on in the world. That is not something that was true 30 years ago. And so the idea that people are not going to try to uh, immigrate uh, and move when they're in a time of war, or a time of drought, or try of famine is nonsense. 
every one of us in this room would do the same thing. And so the idea that often is the view within my home country that the refugee policy of 75 years ago is fit for purpose today, I think, is wrong. Uh, I don't have a solution what the new one is, but I'm just saying that the notion of how the refugee policy in the past worked was based on having large numbers of people who could have been refugees who did not know that they could be. And that is not going to work anymore. And I hate to call it out that way, but I think calling out any other way is wrong. Billions of people could have been refugees and weren't simply because they didn't know they could be. So as we get more populated, we're going to see a lot of other manifestations. We'll see deforestation already issue here in Indonesia. Pollution, general degradation of our planet, water systems. It's not just going to be greenhouse gas, it's not going to be just global warming. It's a whole range of things when you overrun your ecosystems. So, where do we find us in 2017? Well, this last year we discovered a nearby system of seven Earth-like planets around a nearby star, only 40 light years in distance, very nearby. The problem is it still takes us 800,000 years to get, to get there with the fastest spaceship on planet Earth. So technology is not going to save us. We do need to live on the planet that we live in. The other thing that we have is the notion that as you become rich, population growth goes down dramatically. And that is almost universal on planet Earth. So it is pretty clear that there is a way forward. We make everyone rich, and the population of Earth will moderate itself, and everyone will be rich and happy. But that utopia goes completely against the whole course of history. We sort of need to have some world alliance, somehow where we're able to make decisions on a global scale. And the easiest way I know how to make humans work that way is to have an invasion from outer space where aliens <laughs> unite us together against a common enemy. Uh, I'm thinking maybe that's um, But we need to do something short of that to unite humanity. I think getting that right is going to be one of the keys for my lifetime. And I think it's a place where universities will probably have a role in setting the beginnings of it. We already are the places that enemies talk, even at the time of war. Uh, and so it is a great place for us to, uh, to start this conversation. All right, 2017, 2016. 2016 is a very interesting year. Before 2016, I did not ever understand fascism. I just, I just could not understand how it occurred. It made no sense to me. 2016, and I'm an American citizen as well, I saw how populism and the beginnings of fascism get their hold. And so it makes sense to me. I get it now. I'm not sure if I like that, but I sort of see how it happened. Disgruntled citizens are prepared to take the lead. And where there is a vacuum in leadership, in a way forward from conventional leaders, they will seek alternative leaders. And in the modern connected world, this allows people to choose their own message, find their own facts, and find people who provide a narrative that resonates with them. It used to be universities had the libraries. We curated the facts. That's not true. Everyone, well, not necessarily have access to our libraries because they're expensive which is problematic, but they have their own sources of ideas, which they can go choose. And they choose, it turns as humans, we choose the ones that we like, not the ones we, believe, we, we should believe in. And this is a huge problem. Now, I have seen this evolving over the last 10 years or so, and what I figured would happen is it would create some chaos, that every part of the world would break into tiny little factions with their own set of values, and we end up with all these disconnected groups 
not much would happen, but the groups that could get together would continue to be orderly run things. Um, it turns out that uh, this uh, has changed a little bit, and it's because the ability to manipulate the, the message, not dissimilar to what happened in 1933 and onward. And, uh, there are people, this person, doesn't matter particularly who it is, except for many of my friends work with him and work for him, use data science to go out and to tailor the message to individuals. And what you can do is you can go through and have an interactive conversation on the web with people. And you find out what they believe. And then you find out how can I nudge you to a slightly different belief. And over a period of six to 12 months, you can manipulate people's belief into, uh, this is a very sophisticated form of propaganda. And people are doing this. They're using the same thing that sells you TV sets and iPhones. They're going into what makes you being a human. And it's very effective. And again, how do we deal with this? It's a real challenge for us. It's not clear that it's illegal, but it's still scary. All right? So I should say the article where this appears is uh, alleges this, but I would say there's fairly deep evidence that this type of material is occurring. So I would argue that the strong notion, or I should, or I should say that uh, the strong notion of truth is what underlies successful democracy. <clears throat> Whether it be in electing our represent, uh, representatives or informing policy, if we lose our hold on truth, represent, representational democracy will be lost. And so it scares me when I see things about the idea that uh, truth is dead, the alternative facts. This is a news commentator <clears throat> which explains why there is no such thing, unfortunately, more facts. And what you do is you just challenge everything. And you say, you're lying. I don't have to say why you're lying, I just say it. I assert lying, and we move on. And if you do it enough, and fast enough, and enough people do it, it creates chaos, because everyone can pick their own alternative truth. Now, this is also problematic, because truth is a lot more complicated than we like to admit. I'm what we in science like to call a Bayesian. Everything is probabilities. And I look at the world in terms of probabilities because nothing is black and white, unfortunately, including in science. And I try to make decisions based on knowledge I already have or prior knowledge and new evidence or information that comes to light. But as I said, nothing's black and white. The truth really only means 99% sure to most of us, or as a physicist, I'm, I have to be 99.999999% sure before I say it's true. Uh, that would be a high bar in most life. And it's the subtle grayness to truth which seems to be at the heart of many of the issues which I see around the world, where that grayness is exploited with a counterexample, the one in a hundred counterexample, suddenly says that 99% is no longer right. We have to figure out a way of conveying things more successfully. And so this shows itself all the time. Sydney breaks new record with the summer of the hottest on record. People said, this is due to climate change. Well, the correct answer is, it's probably due to climate change or has an influence due to climate change. It's not definitively due to climate change. But you can say you're kind of 98% sure it was due to climate change. Or you might go to something like measles. You go in and you go through and say, should I get a measles vaccination? And this is one of the sites that will come up. It looks very official, but in the end you realize that it's actually something that tells you getting a measles shot vaccination is really, really bad, and it tells you how bad it is, but it says that through essentially a mixture of real facts interlaced with what I would describe as deceptions. Uh, it's not that the people who are doing this are evil. They have essentially bought into false facts themselves. We forget that um, we have gone through with measles and eradicated them from the uh, Western Hemisphere. Measles was around when I was a kid. Last year, there were no endemic measles uh, outbreaks in the US, 
North America and South America. All of them came from the rest of the world. And yet this group is saying these things are bad for you. And many people, two million people died in 1980 in the Western Hemisphere from measles, two million people. And so they get this idea because the vaccinations have worked that we don't need them anymore. Well, I'm afraid that the breakouts are happening and they're happening amongst people who don't get measles vaccinations. And we have a problem. Here's a list of people. People who say you shouldn't get measles. Jenny McCarthy, Jim Carrey, Alicia Silverstone. These are people who are very famous. People who say you should. Peter Doherty, Elizabeth Blackburn, two Nobel Prize winners from Australia. Ian Frazier, the guy who invented the Gardasil vaccine. Experts. Well, who are these guys when we have these superstars who are telling us what to do? <clears throat> and we have seen this all over the world. Gove in the Brexit campaign said we've had far, far too much of experts. And it is true that we, the experts, have done a very poor job of telling people the grayness of our advice, and we have left people behind. And I think it's important that uh, we realize that expertise is important, but it's, it's not always right, and it has to be explained to people. But I would also say that expertise has allowed societies to thrive, and there's only a few times when expertise has been genuinely challenged and thrown away. And I would say, for example, in the Cultural Revolution of China, it was, and things didn't turn out so well for the people of China. It was a bad step backwards for China. We find ourselves today at a time when people are, for the first time, in living memory going backwards. This is the medium household income in the United States. And this is a place where we have seen a sort of a populist revolt in the last couple of years. It's been going up with some ups and downs, but since 1998, almost 20 years, people have median gone backwards. And the median is one thing, but it's even more insidious than that. If we actually look at the distribution of people, 71, so this is income, so this is in real income. So it's the income as you see it today, and you can see from 1971 to 2001, there's a lot more rich people and a lot fewer poor people. People are happy, their lives got better. But what has happened since 2001? Things have gone backwards. That is, these people have all moved that way. There are more people poor than there were rich. This is the first time in living memory that people have seen their incomes go backwards, and they're not happy about it. Now, the last time it happened was in the 30s. But the difference is in the 30s, everyone went backwards. In the new millennium, it's only the poor that have gone backwards. The rich actually have gone forwards. So we have a disparity of wealth. If you look to Indonesia, well, I could only find data in 1998. I'm going to let you figure out what happened here in the last 20 years. But, you know, Indonesia went through some tough times, but the incomes of people moved rapidly to the right many more rich people during that period uh, back there. You grew, they were paying, but people were much, much better off. That gives you a relatively stable and happy society. If that discontinues and people start going backwards, you're gonna have an unhappy society. So we have a problem that we have to figure out how to keep people from going backwards. And that is difficult when things are globalized. Globalization, let's just take Australia and Indonesia. The average Australian is richer than the average Indonesian right now, but we have gotten much closer. It used to be that essentially every Australian worker 30 years ago could outproduce every Indonesian worker because Indonesians didn't have access to the infrastructure and the things that allow them to be very productive. That's changed. Now we overlap. And so productive Indonesian workers are more productive than um, the uh, lower Australian work, lower productive Australian workers, which means those low productive Australian workers' jobs come to Indonesia as they should. Indonesia is better off. Australia is better off in terms of the average, but the people who are left behind are not. And of course, as Indonesia is growing, you've got your bottom half which is being displaced by Laos and Cambodia and other places 
which are also emerging, and eventually Africa. And so we have a problem that the bottom half of society goes backwards in globalization, and we don't know how to redistribute income in a way that keeps people happy. That is a huge question for us to solve. Again, I don't have the answer. If we are going to live together successfully, independent of the issues of the individuals, we have to solve things. And one thing that we have used as a society to come up with this are the Sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them. I've got my Sustainable Development pin here, 17 colors. Talking about the things we need to do to allow all of society to live sustainably on planet Earth. 17 things, they're not it's not rocket science, I say that as a rocket scientist, uh, but it is stuff that you just need to keep working on. Improving health, improving education, making sure people have uh, good quality water, good quality, have electricity. Um, these things uh, are the ingredients that we need to work on. But we are going through and uh, going through a tough time. If we are all going to live on Earth together, and have the grand challenge of humanity not just deal with getting these goals developed, uh, going in the developing world, what chance are we going to have if the developed world doesn't also move forward? That if countries like Australia and the United States and Europe go backwards, how can we expect the developing world also to do the things we need when we're going backwards right now? So in the frankest possible terms, either we quickly recover from where we are right now, which is quite frankly going backwards against these goals, or, in my opinion, we're doomed because we have to make progress on these, or eventually the size of the earth is going to catch up with us. Business as usual will not work. Now humans are remarkably resilient and adaptable, and we are already seeing lots of new technology coming on. So it's not that we're incapable of solving the problem. Um, and we're already beginning to see evidence of what the post-truth wor world is bringing to the average citizen. And I would say that the average citizen is not very happy. But we nonetheless find ourselves in the situation we do. But when the leaders of the world do come and say we must act, they're going to have to ask, act quickly. Uh, not to protect their seats in the next election, or to ensure that their country has a slight advantage over all other countries for the next few years, but I rather agree that there are some huge problems that need to be collectively addressed and solved. And I think we can only do that if we work together in a way that we just simply have not been able to in the past. And we cannot perhaps engage all of our citizenry in these goals um, without giving something back to people. That is, we are going to have to make some sacrifices. The, the, the most well-off will have to make the biggest sacrifice, but the average person may well have to make some sacrifices too, or we're essentially piling on a huge problem to future generations. From my perspective, it needs to be some sort of world-building project that will create some huge middle class along the way that will bring up income, um, lower our uh, population uh, increase, and it has to be something that it goes across borders in the way we see them right now. It is indeed a great race that we have with the great anthropocentric event that will emerge if we fail, the place where we irreparably harm the earth so that we humans can no longer live in it. Don't worry about the rest of the earth. Yes, there will be a lot of extinctions besides ourselves, but life and everything will continue to live on very happily. We are by far, in a way, the most vulnerable species because we require the most uh, fine tuning for 7.4 billions of us uh, to live together. And so what I see is that at current time, we see effectively an impending crash landing of an airplane, humanity, which we can say, I don't understand why this goat is up in the clouds. Don't worry about it. Or we can say, maybe there's a mountain that that goat's on, and I should pull the stick up and move on a new trajectory. I would argue that we need to be the group 
that changes the trajectory. And so we go through and we judge how close to disaster we are, but the reality is we need to just get on with the process of working together and think what working together means. It actually means a new, exciting, and interesting life. It means probably not quite having the same that we have right now, um, but most of the stuff we have, quite frankly, isn't that interesting. It's junk that we don't need. But it will require us to work in a new way, uh, and it will take the people of all parts of the world working together to work. And so until we are ready to go out to the nearest star system and settle another planet, which we can destroy, I suggest we work very hard at keeping the current one in good nick for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. Be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, please mention your name and then yeah. uh, say. So the oh. Yeah, she'll give you a microphone. Oh, okay. Sorry, Oscar. Oh, really? It is. It is. Hi, my name is Sangung. I'm, I'm, I came here especially because I'm a physicist. I'm a theoretical nuclear physicist. Very good. I mean, I'm interested in your view about the global world, but in Indonesia, it's a kind of far away from touching down the ground, when you talk about uh, empowering people with uh, technology and science and so on, what would you suggest to us as to how can we improve that performance uh, in, in, in giving the real impact of our society today? Thank you. Okay, so I think Indonesia is in, um, has a great opportunity. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the average Indonesian is as well off as the average Australian. You've actually already got to a wealth level where your population rate is below replacement. So uh, you already are wealthy enough so that um, your population will not continue to grow out of control. But we also now need to get your people to be affluent. And I would say as affluent as Australia. And that means making sure that we invest as much education in as education as we do in Australia, as much infrastructure as we do, and we work on the global technologies that allow you to use lower amounts of fossil fuels than Australia has done in the past in a way that does not punish and hold you back. Now, we can just wait as Australia and say, good luck with that. Or we can say this is a joint problem. And we need to collectively work somehow to ensure that we co-invest in your education, co-invest in your, in your infrastructure, and co-invest in the, what is ultimately going to be a joint problem. As I like to tell people in Australia, imagine I have, in 2050, 300, really upset, 300 million really upset Indonesians that hate Australia's guts. That is not a good outcome for you or for us in Australia. Um, so it is in our best interest to sacrifice a little bit to help, and it's not just Australia, I use us as an example, but it's, it's China, it's the US, it's the whole world going through, and you guys probably investing in some of your nearby uh, uh, countries as well, where you'll have more impact. So we have to sort of solve things uh, in a, in not just nation by nation, we have to co-invest, I think. And that's a very different uh, system that our political system is ill-equipped to work on today. And I'm not just saying, do it tomorrow, it will happen. I realize I'm talking about some unrealistic utopia. Okay? And it's going to require a certain, that's why I say we need an alien to unite us. Because I'm not quite sure how to do it, but I would say the people in this room will have a better idea than most to figure out how to at least start making steps that way. More question? Yeah, please. And then, uh, I'm Arnold. I'm interesting because, uh, because in the last few years, the technology is growing so fast, especially uh, in line with the uh, information technology. Yes. But the economy is decreasing even faster. Yeah. The second thing 
in the world of disruption, a lot of things, a lot of innovation come up. But again, the jobs decreasing. Yeah. And by the end, the third one is about the globalization. When we are talking about the globalization, the emerging thing is protection. So when we talk about this, what would be the best solution? I would suggest thinking about the economic integration in a way that Australia used to have with UK. It's not just globalization, it's not just competition, it's about commonwealth. That's my idea. Thank you. So that is essentially increasing the in inner circle and the outer circle. And I would argue we need to do that probably across the whole world somehow to make it work. So I understand your, per, your, what, what your point is. Um, you are absolutely right. Amongst all of this, uh, there are, I think, is questions of whether or not the productivity measure that we make is accurate. Uh, I think there's some quite strong arguments, which I think are probably right, but I can't prove it at this point, that productivity growth has been poorly measured because all the technology, we just don't capture it at productivity measurements. And my wife works for the Productivity uh, Commission in Australia, so she thinks a lot about this. So I just listen a bit to her. Um, and then uh, finally, we have the whole mechanization uh, of, of the change of work coming on. And people split into two camps. Ah, oh, it's all happened before. Humans are going to be replaced. Uh, but they've always found a, a niche. I would argue that uh, this one's a little different. That I think that it may well be that many things, uh, many humans' capacity will be superseded by, by um, machines. And I don't know how to deal with that because you need to give people reason. If you don't, giving people money is not enough. You need to give them purpose and, 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 and meaning. And we need to think about that. Because the way things are going right now, it's going to be C++ programmers are the only ones who have jobs around the world and a few engineers. And the rest of us could go do something else. So um, we're going to have to, to do that. And I, I think uh, part of that, if machines do a lot of the work, you know, maybe we all only work 10 hours a week and have a lot of leisure time. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch emerge, but I don't have a solution. Uh, please note that in the next session we will talk more about globalization with our uh, second speaker. And uh, last question. Uh, yeah, please mention your name and uh, institution. Uh, my name is Glenn Vijaya. I'm currently interning at a law firm in Kuningan. Uh, my question is very simple. What is your take on renewable energy projects? Because we've seen that uh, Scandinavian countries such as Denmark or Sweden has been exceeding EU's uh, uh, performance in having renewable energy. And what is your view on that? And what has Australia done on that as well? well uh, very hot issue and I actually even had a slide or two on it, which I took out for lack of time. Uh, so renewable energy is clearly 50 years from now is probably going to be almost the only uh, energy we have if we can sort out how to store it. So there's some very simple ways to store it which will work very well in Indonesia. Uh, some people at ANU have been just doing the brute force where you put water tanks on top of mountains and you pump the water up and you let it run down and you'd be surprised how much energy you can put up there. It's about 80% efficient and it's relatively cheap and the engineering is simple. Things like that already will be cost effective in a remote, any place that is using diesel and has mountains, this is a cheaper technology already then. Uh, so making the energy renewable is already very cheap. Um, my house, I, the, the energy I create on my roof is cheaper than the energy I buy from the electricity company. But the problem comes around storage. And we, unless we can store the energy, we have a problem. And what you don't want to do is what we've done in Australia, which is to uh, say renewables are great and then not worry about storage or the grid or the economics of how you uh, provide baseload electricity, which has been ignored in Australia. And so we have a real mess in Australia where it's almost impossible um, to uh, generate electricity 
uh, at times when the renewables aren't running. And that's something we have to address. So you need to have a system design. But renewables are here, they're gonna be cheap, and I really do think if we get along with the storage right, that will be probably in 30 years the only type of electricity which is cost effective to use. In Australia, it is substantially cheaper right now to do a wind farm than a coal-fired power station. Not just a little cheaper, a lot cheaper. But the problem is the coal-fired power station runs 24 hours a day, and the wind farm runs when it's windy. That's the problem. Uh, I was told that we can have one more question. Uh, yeah, Satoshi. Uh, my name is Hotasi Nababan. Uh, how do you see uh, 50, 100 years ago uh, a leader uh, that Australia would change? How do you get a vision that the West, the Europeans would be minority, more Chinese, more Indians, more even Indonesians living in Australia, and uh, the state totally change, and more people coming in to get more resources. With Australia, yeah. still abundant of resources. Yeah. And it's going to be the object of uh, migration of people. Thanks. Absolutely. So I, uh, I think Australia has an obligation to continue to grow through immigration. Uh, it's, the large, it, it's the most underpopulated place on planet Earth, even when you include the deserts and everything. If you say how much fertile land is there and how many people are there, it's the most underpopulated place. The good news is Australia is already 27% of the people in Australia were not born in Australia, me being one of them. So that makes it uh, literally in terms of uh, countries in the world, it is the most that way already. And I should say, when you run around Australia, you will see Indonesians and Chinese and Indians and Europeans, a whole range. It is a very diverse culture, but it's still very Australian. And so, from my perspective, it's great. It's one of the things that I think makes Australia a really interesting country and why I love living there. So I think Australia will be a big Australia. It will get bigger and bigger. Uh, and I think that is a good thing because Australia has the land and capacity to be bigger. Uh, and I think if Australia continues to make sure that it welcomes its immigrants and has them uh, you know, be immersed in, in, in society so that you are both an Indonesian and an Australian, just like I'm an American and an Australian, then I think it's been a very successful model thus far. And I would hope it's the it's the optimal way forward. It's certainly the way I see Australia. So I don't think it's a problem. Indeed, I think it's a necessity. So I, I personally think, you know, in 150 years, I would expect Australia to probably have 200 million people on it, rather than the 24 million people we have on it today. I'm sure this will get picked up in the Australian. <laughs> I, I think that is the correct trajectory for the country. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I think the, the time is finished. Please join me to thank uh, Professor Brown.